Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Vinyl Den, your channel for record collecting by record collectors. I'm Nick. Today, checking out the new album by Halsey, The Great Impersonator. There's a bunch of links down below. You got links for the Vinyl Den Facebook group, for the merch page, for the Spotify and Apple Music playlist that I put together every week, and the Patreon page. So make sure to check all that out. Like always, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure you give me all thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below, and make sure you hit that notification bell so you're notified every time I release new episodes. So Halsey's fifth studio album, The Great Impersonator, was just released on October 25th. This is the follow-up to her 2021 album, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power, which was produced by Trent Reznor. It was a fantastic album. That was actually the album that got me into Halsey. I had never really listened to any of her music before, and then that album came out, I listened to it, I was blown away by it and ended up being one of my favorite albums of 2021. So when I saw that she wasn't working with Trent on this new album, she was actually going with like a whole group of producers. I didn't really know what to expect with it. I kind of went into it with like a uh, cautious optimism, but uh, you know, I, I was really impressed with this new album. But once I understood like the overall concept of the album, I understood why she went with multiple different producers because there's multiple different sounds, multiple different genres across this album. The album was recorded over the last two years at the iconic Electric Lady Studios, which of course is the, the recording studio that Jimi Hendrix built just before his death in 1970. And there's been a ton of great albums recorded there over the years. Halsey did kind of a cool thing in the lead up to the album release. So the 18 days before the album came out, there's 18 tracks on the album. So on her social media accounts, she posted a picture of herself impersonating the iconic musicians that inspired the songs on this album. Some of the pictures that she had were Dolly Parton for Hometown, PJ Harvey for Dog Years, David Bowie for Darwinism, Stevie Nicks for Panic Attack, Joni Mitchell for The End, and Kate Bush, I Never Loved You. So on the surface level, the general concept of this album is Halsey looking back and exploring who she would be as a person, as an artist, had she lived in different decades. So she, she focused on the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. But if you dig down a little deeper into these songs, you realize that a lot of these songs are kind of dark, actually. And a lot of them deal with Halsey kind of facing her mortality. I know she's gone through a lot in her personal life over the last couple of years. She had a child. She's had multiple health scares. So, you know, it, it, she's had a lot going on, and I think they come through in a lot of these songs. And overall, you know, yes, it is a dark album, but it's also very raw at times and very personal also. And while she's paying homage to many of her musical idols across decades, across genres, there's still this unifying sound on this album. So when I saw that she was working with a group of producers instead of one or two, I want to say there's about a dozen or so producers on this album, I expected there to be a little bit more of a disjointed sound because she's touching on multiple genres, multiple decades of music, but there really isn't. And I think it's a testament to Halsey and the quality of musician that she is at this point in her career. And this is probably one of the best produced albums I've listened to this year, which, you know, I wasn't really expecting. With all the different cooks in the kitchen on this album, like I said, there's like a dozen or more different producers on this album. It all has the same kind of overall quality in the production. And you might think, well, maybe it's because there's typically, even though there's a, a large group of producers on this album, a lot of the times there's like three or four producers that produce a lot of the songs on the album or a majority of the songs on the album. And that's not really the case with this. When you go down through the track listing of the 18 songs on here, and I think almost every song has a different collection of producers or a different combination of all the ones that are, that are involved. What Halsey put together with this album might be one of the most creative albums this year or in the last couple of years. I think not only the theme of this album is very creative, how she put it all together, and really how she blended all these songs. Because like I said, you got songs that are inspired by Cher on here. You got songs that are inspired by David Bowie on here. You got songs uh, inspired by Dolly Parton. Lots of other people across multiple genres. But yeah, she's able to craft it all together and make this thing really work as one big piece. I think what really helped her put this whole thing together was the fact that she wasn't really trying to replicate those artists. She wasn't trying to do you know, a song of hers in their style. She, it is her own creation. Those, these are her own songs, but she's using those as influences on the, the creation of those songs. And I think the way that she was able to balance herself in these songs, her own style, her own sound, with the sound and the influence of those other artists, I think is what makes this album so fantastic to listen to. Because I think it could have gone a completely different direction had she tried to maybe 
like copy those icons a little bit more, I think this album could have come off as like a bad cover album. And I really like the way she was able to evolve her sound on a lot of these tracks. You know, Halsey is not an artist that has a lot of stripped down, you know, almost acoustic songs, and there's several of them across this album. I know track sequencing and track order probably doesn't uh, matter to a lot of people out there. It still does to me. I still like to have a really strong song kick off the album. And I think she does with this one. Only Living Girl in L.A. is the lead single, lead track on the album. And it's, I think, in my, in my opinion, it's one of the best songs on this album. It really kind of sets the tone. And it's a really interesting concept for the album because even though these are all original tracks, she's because she's focusing on and paying homage to different musical idols, it still has this kind of familiar feel to these songs. Some of my favorite songs on this album are Panic Attack, Only Living Girl in L.A., Ego, Hometown, which Hometown was inspired by Dolly Parton. And I didn't know that when I first went through the album and listened to it. And I could really tell there was a really strong Dolly Parton influence on that one. So I wasn't really surprised when I saw that was the the case for that one. Uh, Life of the Spider, I Believe in Magic, I Never Loved You, Lonely is the Muse, which is probably my favorite song on this album. Those are some of my favorite ones. There are some other good ones too. And even though it's a really long album, it's 18 tracks, it's over an hour's worth of music. There's not a single skippable track, in my opinion, on this album. And I think the two tracks that are closest to being skippable on this one are The Great Impersonator and Lucky, which Lucky is a takeoff of Lucky from, by, uh, by Britney Spears. You know, those are two tracks that, you know, maybe aren't necessarily skippable, but they're definitely my, my two least favorite on the album. So after listening to the album a couple of times, I'd have to give this album a 9.5 out of 10. I was that impressed with this one. This is an album that I'm sure will probably end up pretty high on my best albums of the year list. Really the only thing I can knock this album on is the fact that a couple of the songs on here, so she's trying to, you know, the, the, the great impersonator on this album is her, and she's almost impersonating these idols that she has. And sometimes it comes across a little forced, I think, on a couple of the songs. You know, even though I don't think they're bad songs, it just, I don't think it quite worked the way she wanted it to. I like what she did with the album artwork. There's a standard version, a standard cover of this album. And then there's four separate album covers. I think they're all limited edition albums that are available on her website. There's a 70s theme, an 80s theme, a 90s theme, and a 2000s theme on it. And this is also an album that I don't even think I made it halfway through the album. I hopped on her website, ordered a copy of it. Uh, this is an album I definitely have to have on vinyl. And comparing this album to her previous album... I think If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power is a little bit stronger of an album. I was never a big Nine Inch Nails fan. I'm not an industrial fan. But I really love the way that Trent Reznor's musical style blended with her vocals. And kind of the strange thing is, the first time I listened to this album, I got a really strong Taylor Swift, the Torture Poets Department kind of feel or vibe to this album. And it's not because she pays homage to Taylor Swift on here. The songs really aren't similar between the two albums, but it somehow reminded me of that other album. It's just kind of, I don't know, it's just a kind of a, the way I listened to it and kind of how the, the songs unfolded. Well, that's all I got for you today, guys. Thanks for checking the show out. Make sure you drop me a comment down below. I'd love to know what you guys think of this album. Have you checked it out yet? Are you planning on picking up a copy of it? You know, how would you rate it? Let me know what you guys think. Like always, if you enjoyed the episode, make sure you give me a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below. That's all I got. Until next time, keep on spinning. Peace. Peace.